Amen. So this evening, Lord willing, we'll see, we come to uh, the last message in our series on the Belgic Confession. So I invite you to turn in your Psalter hymnals to page 90 at the back. We'll read the latter part of Article 37. And uh, then uh, turning as well in your Bibles to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and we're going to be uh, reading several verses from Revelation chapter 20, and uh, then we're going to be reading Revelation 22 as well. Uh, Revelation 20, that's, uh, or rather 21, that's what I intended to say. That's uh, page 1230 in the Pew Bible. And actually, uh, back up one page in the Confession of Faith. We're going to read all of Article 37 so that you get the context and the flow of it, even though we've spent time with the earlier paragraphs already. Article 37, The Last Judgment. Finally, we believe, according to the word of God, when the time appointed by the Lord, which is unknown to all creatures, is come, and the number of the elect complete, that our Lord Jesus Christ will come from heaven corporally and visibly as he ascended with great glory and majesty to declare himself judge of the living and the dead, burning this old world with fire and flame to cleanse it. Then all men will personally appear before this great judge, both men and women and children, that have been from the beginning of the world to the end thereof, being summoned by the voice of the archangel and by the sound of the trump of God. For all the dead shall be raised out of the earth and their souls joined and united with their proper bodies in which they formerly lived. As for those who shall then be living, they shall not die as the others, but be changed in the twinkling of an eye and from corruptible become incorruptible. Then the books, that is to say the consciences, shall be opened and the dead judged according to what they shall have done in this world, whether it be good or evil. Nay, all men shall give account of every idle word they have spoken, which the world only counts amusement and jest. And then the secrets and hypocrisy of men shall be disclosed and laid open before all. And therefore, the consideration of this judgment is justly terrible and dreadful to the wicked and ungodly, but most desirable and comfortable to the righteous and elect, because then their full deliverance shall be perfected, and there they shall receive the fruits of their labor and trouble which they have borne. Their innocence shall be known to all, and they shall see the terrible vengeance which God shall execute on the wicked who most cruelly persecuted, oppressed, and tormented them in this world, and who shall be convicted by the testimony of their own consciences, and shall become immortal, but only to be tormented in the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. But on the contrary, the faithful and elect shall be crowned with glory and honor, and the Son of God will confess their names before God his Father and his elect angels. All tears shall be wiped from their eyes, and their cause which is now condemned by many judges and magistrates as heretical and impious will then be known to be the cause of the Son of God. And for a gracious reward, the Lord will cause them to possess such a glory as never entered into the heart of man to conceive. Therefore, we expect that great day with a most ardent desire to the end that we may fully enjoy the promises of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And give attention to the word of God, first of all, from Revelation 21, beginning with verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then uh, please turn uh, to Revelation 22 beginning with verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. 
dear brothers and sisters, friends. I imagine that the words that we've just read from Revelation 21 and 22 impress you much the way that they impress me. The way in which the Bible comes to a close is indeed a crescendo. It it, it ends on a thrilling note, and yet, at the same time, it ends on a devastating note as well. And that's what uh, we're talking about uh, with the subject before us this evening. As we come to the end of our consideration of the Belgic Confession, and particularly of Article 37, we come to deal with the topic of the uh, final uh, recompense and the final reward. And we see both of these uh, topics, both of these doctrines, if you will, laid out rather clearly for us, uh, not only in Article 37, but even in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. You see, the end is hastening on. The end of all things is coming And it's closer today than it was yesterday. And it's significantly closer uh, this year than it was when John wrote these words, perhaps around the year 90 A.D. The Lord Jesus is coming again. And the question is, before us this evening, what is your relationship to him? What is your relationship to his word? Because what awaits you at his return has everything to do with our answer to those two questions. So this evening, again, our, uh, our theme is eternal recompense and reward. And, and uh, suitably then, we're simply going to focus on two points this evening. Uh, first of all, the eternal recompense of wickedness. And secondly, the eternal reward of righteousness. Now, we said uh, a couple of weeks ago when we last uh, dealt uh, with Article 37, uh, we we uh, talked a lot about the final judgment. We've talked about the return of Christ. And, And now what we're dealing with is the separation that is taking place at the final judgment. And the reality, the unavoidable reality that is held out before us is the reality of the place that we refer to by the name hell of the fact that there is eternal punishment that awaits those who do not believe in Jesus and who are not united to him by his spirit. Now, this is not not a popular uh, doctrine in any age, but it may be peculiarly unpopular in our age. You find theologians and preachers actually stumbling over themselves to explain hell away. And so there is actually a book that was published uh, probably around the turn of the century uh, that was aptly named Erasing Hell. Uh, The contention of the author uh, was that um, in in this uh, haste to get rid of the doctrine uh, of hell as we understand it, in in the, the haste to get Uh, rid of this uh, idea that there is eternal, that is, unending conscious punishment given to those who are not in Christ Jesus, you have to get rid of the Bible itself. For the Bible very clearly speaks of this reality. Some some have gone to the word hell and they've said, well, hell is a made-up idea. Uh, This is a word that that wouldn't have been used by the apostles. They're right when they say that, by the way. Uh, This is a word that that came uh, later, uh, that came to be used later, and that's also accurate if you follow church history. Uh, For hell uh, is not from the Greek language, just uh, to make make sure we're all on the same page. But then again, the vast majority of the words in the Bible, uh, as we read it in English, are not from the Greek language either. Uh, So that's not a very strong argument. Uh, But nevertheless, uh, people have tried to explain it, uh, get rid of the idea of hell by by simply uh, getting rid of the word itself. And yet, 
uh, the word itself is not what is significant. It is the reality that the word describes. And you can't explain away the realities of uh, punishment in hell as described by the prophets, the apostles, by Jesus himself, simply by getting rid of a word. For Jesus, uh, you probably know this, uh, refers to eternal punishment more, than, more frequently than any other prophet or any apostle. But what do we mean? What, what are we talking about when we talk about hell? I have uh, four ideas here that uh, we're going to uh, briefly review from the scriptures. And the first is that hell, uh, or the reality that we refer to as hell, is a place of exclusion from God. Now there's a caveat here, okay, because God is not absent. But it is a place of exclusion from God. Uh, uh, take, for example, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, he, he warns those listening to him, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Now let's just pause to note here that hell is not reserved for those who don't go to church. Hell is not reserved uh, uh, for those who don't take the name of God upon their lips. But that Jesus is clearly uh, indicating that, that in addition to such persons, there are persons who actually have some kind of a show of religion. They have some kind of a show of a relationship to him. Even, even to the point that, that you might say in, in our common uh, language that they're ministers of the gospel. That, that there, there are actually those who have preached the gospel, perhaps, who will find themselves cast out. But the, the final verse is what we're really keying in on here. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Okay, so it's a place of, of exclusion or of separation from God. So just imagine, right? Uh, imagine Jesus, the, one, the same one, by the way, who says, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. The same Jesus, whose arms are open for the little children as the disciples try to shoo them away, and Jesus takes them up on his lap and he blesses them. That same Jesus who welcomes uh, sinners, um, like uh, the notorious woman who comes and washes her, his feet with, with ointment and with her tears. Imagine that same Jesus saying, Away from me, you evildoer. What a horrible, horrible thing to contemplate. But this is at the root of what eternal punishment is. It is separation from God. There is no kind of relationship there. There's an estrangement. Uh, likewise, Jesus says in Matthew 25, verses 41 and 46, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. Again, this idea of banishment. This idea of exclusion or of separation. And uh, one author uses this illustration, which I think is helpful to understand the contrast with our next idea, which is that hell is a place characterized by the continual experience of the unmixed, undiluted wrath of God. So how can it be a place of exclusion or separation from God on the one hand, and yet a place um, characterized by the continued, uh, continual experience of God's wrath? Well, he, he says, you know, I have a friend who lives um, 17 hours away from me, but he's a dear friend. He's a friend of my heart such that I can call him any time that I like, and, and I, I feel comfortable to pour out my heart to him and him to me. 
Um, and, and at whatever time we meet after being away from each other for uh, many years at a time, perhaps, it is as if we never separated. He says, take that idea on the one hand and contrast that with the estranged couple that sits in the counseling room, just inches apart. And yet, there's no wall thick enough, tall enough that, that could describe the distance between that couple in their coldness and their lack of love toward each other. There is a separation, though they be ever so close. Well, in in, an analogous way, so it is in hell with God. It is separation from all of his love, from all of his favor, from all of the benefits that are often called common grace benefits, from anything good, from any relenting in his wrath. A wrath of uh, unmitigated wrath of God poured out continually. This is hell. And to to establish the second idea of the presence of God in hell, turn with me uh, back a few pages in Revelation uh, chapter 6, verses 6 and... um, 16 and 17. Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. Um, We we read of of the the judgment, and we read of of those who are fleeing the judgment, calling out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? You see, The the reality of being in the presence of Almighty God and being a sinner is the most awful thing. Because uh, we, we read in God's Word elsewhere that God's holiness is as a consuming fire. And so it is that as if we come into the presence of God, apart from Jesus Christ, our mediator... If we come into the presence of God with impurity in us, To be in the presence of Almighty God is a most horrendous affair. Such that these people, what they hope for is the destruction of their lives. They hope to be hidden from Him. They hope to to somehow escape Him. And yet they cannot. They cannot. Because His wrath is kindled and He judges But then turning over uh, a few pages forward now, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, wouldn't you like to hear me have a sermon on that? Not going there tonight. He too will drink of the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. You see, hell is a place of separation from God, but at the same time of continual exposure, unending exposure to the wrath of God. The wrath and mercy which he in mercy withholds for this time. The wrath that he has held back until the time that the cup of iniquity is full. That wrath poured out unendingly. Well, then thirdly, hell is a place where there is no relief. Relief from what? Well, relief from the wrath of God, first of all. But hell is also a place where there is no relief, even from guilt or from suffering. Um, In Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, we read this. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So here's another practical note. Who you see in heaven will surprise you, perhaps. That was certainly Jesus' message uh, to the Pharisees and and to the the Jewish elite, if we can call them that. Um, In the context, by the way, of the Roman centurion who believes in Christ for the healing of his servant. But he goes on to say, but the subjects of the kingdom 
will be thrown outside. Again, this idea of separation into the darkness. Again, separation from the light, which is God, as we've read in Revelation 22, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what do we make of this, of this idea of weeping and of gnashing of teeth? Think about, think about the saddest event that you've experienced in your earthly lives. Well, we do experience great sadness, don't we? Um, the death of a loved one, probably for m- many of us, is the occasion of the greatest sadness that we experience in this world. And oh, how the tears pour down. Maybe some of you have experienced asking this question, will the crying ever stop? But then with the passing of time, the waves of grief, they become a little bit further spread out. By God's grace, you, you, you pick up and you begin to move on. You find with the psalmist, Psalm 30, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy does come in the morning. You find that despite the the loss of this dearly beloved uh, person in your life, that life does go on and that there are other blessings in this world. But imagine a weeping that never, ever, ever ends. Now maybe some of you have experienced sadness for such a long time that you long for heaven. And you say to yourself, one of the things I look forward to about heaven is that there's not going to be any more crying. We read that, right? Revelation chapter 21. But the person in hell has no such comfort. It is a continually, a continual, unceasing weeping of misery and sadness. And the gnashing of teeth, the grinding of teeth, right? What, what, what does that evoke? Well, that evokes it is certainly the idea of pain, right? Often, uh, if we experience intense pain, we begin to gnash our teeth, looking for some kind of relief from the pain. But gnashing of teeth also has to do with anger. And so you see that, that there is actually, that, that people in hell, they do not feel remorse, They feel anger, unending anger. There's no repentance. The continual, the the continuing experience of enmity from God, enmity toward God. It's not that with a time after a time of suffering, there is a repentance that comes. That's not what the Bible, that's not what the word of God teaches us. But that this is an unending gnashing of teeth but that there's also the, this idea, Mark uh, chapter 9, of the worm that does not die, and the fire that is not quenched. Mark uh, 9, verse 48. This is another picture that is very vivid for us. Uh, a picture that, that aptly uh, captures uh, what hell is like. Um, and, and certainly, uh, well, let, let's take the idea of fire first, because... Uh, The popular imagination has grabbed hold of the idea of fire that used to be something that was vividly portrayed. Like if you look at medieval art, for example, um, you find the religious art that there's a lot of uh, very graphic uh, depictions of hell. You have Dante's Inferno, these ideas that have come into uh, the literature uh, of the Western world. And then this becomes actually something that's laughable to people. Interestingly, in our time, the idea of of fire and hell is something that's laughable. Well, what's being described here isn't so much a literal fire as it is the experience of continually burning. Think about, boys and girls, think about how it feels when you touch the stove after it's been used. The teapot, maybe. You draw your hand away because there's that immediate jolt of pain, that immediate sensation. Well, hell is like that all the time. Pain. Unending pain. Some of you deal with chronic pain. Now imagine that without end. 
That's hell. Again, no hope of relief, no hope of, of heaven uh, to alleviate the pain, to, to help you endure the pain. In fact, the knowledge that this is unending is, is itself the most terrifying part. But then the, the, the worm does not die. And it seems uh, that, that um, this is a reference on the one hand uh, to, to a battle, imagine a, a battlefield filled with dead soldiers, okay? Many times the bodies would be burned uh, or consumed by, uh, by worms. That's the way it is, the, the gas reality, ghastly reality of, of warfare. And, and Jesus takes that image and he applies it to hell. Um, you see, but there's, there's uh, a certain point in, in the, that illustration where the burning ceases and where the, the worms are, uh, no longer have anything to consume. But this is, hell is a place that the consuming is never done. And I believe what's being referred to here is the conscience. Imagine, you know, we, uh, we so easily silence our consciences, don't we? We're our own worst enemies. Um, and, and we learn to, uh, you know, that we do something uh, for the first time and our consciences immediately say, warning, 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 don't do this. But because we want it, uh, eventually that warning begins to recede in our minds and, and we become calloused uh, towards uh, whatever it is that we're doing. But now imagine that your conscience were suddenly to be acted on in some way by God such that you could recall every idle word that you ever spoke, every foolish thing that you ever said, every wicked deed that you ever committed, and you were to, for the first time ever, trace the motives of your thinking and what led you to do whatever it is that you did. That's hell. No forgiveness. No atonement, no escape, and no end. That is hell. A place of no relief. One uh, Puritan says of the conscience, and I think this is uh, very uh, instructive for us. He says, conscience, which should have been the sinner's curb on earth, that is, um, to keep the sinner from going further, becomes the whip that must lash his soul in hell. Neither is there any faculty or power belonging to the soul of man so fit and able to do it as his own conscience. That which was the seat and center of all guilt now becomes the seat and center of all torments. Dear child of God, you know what? One of the things that we look forward to and we talk about with one another is a cessation of sin when we enter into the presence of Christ forevermore, that there is no more sin, but that there's no more guilt either. That's something maybe we don't always talk about. No more guilt, no more shame. But hell is a place characterized by guilt and by shame. And so finally, hell is a place utterly devoid of hope. Even in the darkest night that we experience here in this life. For the Christian, there is that which co continues to compel us forward. Even when we can't see it, we say, I know that there's a light somewhere. And we press on. Even Psalm 88, the darkest uh, uh, portion of God's word, perhaps, in the sense that there is no felt relief, there is no experience relief on the part of the psalmist, what he continues to do is reach up and grab a hold of, of Jehovah, the God of the covenant, saying, in the midst of my darkness, in the midst of my blackness, this is what offers relief, that I'm holding on to my God. I can't see clearly now, I can't see the end, but I have hope. Because I know that God does not change. I know that he, uh, I am his and he is mine. You see, that's the comfort that we have as children of God. But there's no comfort like this in hell. Hell is a place of absolute hopelessness. Well then, 
what's the point in talking about it? Why are we talking about it this evening? Three things, three, three takeaways here. First of all, hell ought to create fear in us. Now, for the child of God, that fear is removed. The child of God ought to have no fear for his or herself in hell. But if you are outside of Christ, you ought to feel afraid. Because however bad any given day of your life or any period season of your life might be, what awaits in hell is far worse. But the thing is, is that Jesus calls you again this evening to come to him. He reminds you this evening that hell is reserved for those who do not receive him, who do not uh, believe in him, who do not trust in him. But he calls you to trust in him tonight. He reminds you that this is the reason that he came into the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in his son, uh, or that he sent his son into the world, that whosoever believeth in him should not die, but have everlasting life. That's the call of God in Christ this evening. To feel afraid and to run into Jesus Christ and to seek refuge, knowing that as he says in John 6, he turns away no one who comes unto him in faith. He turns away no one who comes and bows before him and, and casts uh, all his sins upon him and seeks his forgiveness. You see, uh, because 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 reminds us that hell is reserved for those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So come and trust in him this evening. Secondly, worship. Now, the reason that many are uh, embarrassed of the, uh, the doctrine of hell, the many that... Uh, the reason that many want to distance themselves from it is that they're using their human uh, rationale and, and, and they're trying to determine what God is based on the limitations of their own mind. And they're saying, the God that I know wouldn't do this. The God that I know couldn't do this. To which we ought to humbly respond, the God that you know is not the God of the Bible. You see... God is glorified in the eternal judgment of the unrepentant and the unbelieving. I acknowledge that that is a hard truth to receive, but it is a truth of God's word nonetheless. God is glorified in the judgment of the sinful, unrepentant, unbelieving, period. And in fact, he is no less glorified in the judgment of the unrepentant than he is glorified in the salvation of sinners. God is glorified through the manifestation of his judge, uh, justice and of his righteousness in his judgment. God's justice is, is uh, established and it is uh, praised, it is glorified in his judgment of the ungodly. Even as he is glorified in showing mercy to sinners in Christ. So we ought to worship God as we contemplate the reality of hell. Thirdly, finally, evangelism. Now, a word here. I know that this congregation accepts the biblical reality of hell. I know that this is just a foundational doctrine of our body. But I have a question. Is that being borne out in your life from day to day? Because I think that we live more like universalists than we do like those who believe in a place called hell to which sinners will go apart from Christ. What does the universalist believe? The universalist believes that we all get to heaven somehow. That all ways to God are equally legitimate and um, that, first of all, that if you're a good person, then you're going to go to heaven and uh, 
then you know you kind of explain away the bad people and there, there'll be a, a second opportunity for them. But the Bible doesn't teach that. But are we living that way? To, to put the question a different way, what would it look like to live as if hell is real in our relationship to the unbelieving? Would it not look like um, bold gospel proclamation? Would it not look like the sharing of our faith? Would it not look like a burden for those who are unconverted uh, rather than a, a kind of uh, judgmentalism or a, a, a lack of compassion altogether for them? You see, the doctrine of hell ought also to move our hearts with pity for those who are perishing. Thank God that we will not be in hell, those of us who have received in Christ by faith. But contemplate the reality that there may be those among your friend's circle, there may be those in your families, there may be your good, decent, upright neighbors who do not know Christ, who do not acknowledge Christ, who do not worship Christ, who do not believe in Christ. This is where they're going. It ought to motivate us. Not as if to save sinners from God's hands, but understanding that the gospel message is the means that God has ordained in order to deliver sinners from their condemnation. So fear, worship, and evangelism. Unfortunately, and yet I think fittingly, we're going to save the second point for next week because it is a blessed consideration all on its own. Praise God that, that the, the majority of what we've read from Revelation 21 and 22 is not the word of judgment, but the word of blessedness, the word of rest, the word of peace, the word of joy, that belongs to all those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, who says tonight, verse 17, Revelation 22, come. And again, him who here says, come. Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you with hearts that are overwhelmed by the reality of eternal punishment and condemnation. And yet, with thanksgiving that you have delivered us from such uh, an end through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, apply your word to our hearts. We pray particularly for those who do not believe, uh, for those who are skeptical of the message, those who are skeptical of the faith, those who are skepti uh, skeptical of you and of your claims. May you change their hearts, soften them, draw them, so that none here this evening may find that they end up in that place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Lord, to you be all the praise, honor, and glory forever and ever. Amen.